Imagine you're a young man who favors art, but his country asks him to become a fighter pilot because the nation is at war. Then you're asked to bomb Hawaii. This is a true story never told before. Here on Figments, the power of imagination, on Think Tech Hawaii, I'm really excited about today because I'm going to have an elderly gentleman who has quite a story to tell. And as I said, it hasn't been told before. I'm Dan Big Leaf, Big Leaf, and I'm the host of Figments, the power of imagination. We try to entertain and inspire, and I suspect we'll do both today with it. A really great story about this fighter pilot artist turned fighter pilot turned artist. So I actually have a picture. Of, first, let me do the title slide because I took the time to make it on PowerPoint. My guest is Lieutenant Colonel retired Bob Kenai Heaney, U.S. Air Force. I bet you thought he was from Japan. Hmm? I do have a picture of Kenai's airplane when he was asked to bomb Hawaii. That might not be it. Let me welcome Bob Kenai Keeney. Keeney, aloha. Aloha. Great was, to that be with your, was that your bird there, Kenai, that no, I had? I, th I think mine was pretty ugly, but not that ugly. No, no <laughs> that wasn't it. So um, Kenai was my boss in the 426 Killer Claws. Claw, claw, claw. Claw, claw. claw. <laughs> and... <laughs> A great mentor. He was the squadron commander when I was an ops officer. Much of what I learned about leadership, I learned from Kenai. Uh, and he's truly got a unique story of being an Air Force fighter pilot with a penchant for art. We're going to in, in look at both of those while we talk about being asked to bomb Hawaii, because he was asked to bomb Hawaii with live bombs and not on a practice range. You're not going to believe this one. Kenai, you sent me a bunch of pictures, uh, pictures of pictures and your pictures from your career. So I put together this little montage, I think we call it. And I love this because it shows you as a cadet at Texas A&M or a student, uh, maybe you were called, then as, uh, it and you look like somebody who would give underclassmen a real hard time. <laughs> then as a student in pilot training and uh, all of us who went through pilot training, remember, you're just trying to get through, man. Stay out of the way. Stay out of the target. Yeah, uh, and keep get your lunch down. Keep your <laughs> lunch down. Don't vomit. You know, little stuff like that. <laughs> and then uh, maybe a year and a half later in Southeast Asia is an A seven fighter pilot. And I would submit that you're a different person in many ways in each of those pictures. What do you think? Oh yeah, yes. Um, you know, first of all. I was probably, I'm, I'm 72 years old. I'm probably one of the younger people you'll meet who actually <laughs> uh, had combat time in Southeast Asia because I went right through four years of college and right into pilot training and then right into, well, after survival schools and then A7 school and then went right, yeah. right to Southeast Asia and still didn't get there until the last month of the air war in Southeast Asia. So yeah, that was, that was quite a change. And that picture of me as a cadet, I actually had, I was a squadron commander of about 80 people. And that was more a responsibility than I had until I was a Lieutenant Colonel in the Air Force. So that was a, that was quite a thing. And there's my hero shot from, I did, have, nice. I did have a sword, yeah. which my son yeah. actually carried. He actually went through the same squadron as I did. And he has a picture wow. looking very much like that because the uniform didn't change much at all. And then you're in pilot training, your hero shot. And then you're yes. in the war. And, and I was in the war. And I was really lucky. I went through pilot training. And I was lucky for, for when I made my choices to have finished high enough in the class to get the airplane I wanted, which was a single seat airplane, which, you know, I had had a hard time keeping my lunch down in T-37s. And I desperately wanted to get the other person out of my plane. So I was so happy to get the <laughs> A-7. Yeah, and I want to show such a wonderful... some A-7s here if we can to show the svelte, uh, okay, stout yes. little but single seat, and that's key. Yes. The short little ugly fellow, we called it, fellow. Yeah. Whatever. And uh, you see the tiger teeth on those planes. As a squadron artiste, I was in charge of put, putting those on the plane correctly. And I had these helpers and stencils and stuff. That was one of my jobs as squadron artiste. But yeah, we were, those airplanes, we were stationed at, uh, well, we were TDY to Barbers Point, Hawaii in 1975, 76 on an exercise. And uh, we actually were flying a live 
a live firepower demonstration continuously on the Big Island in the saddle. Putting on a between, show for the army and other folks, right? Let me explain what that means. Uh, to, okay. Yeah. To, so it's dropping real bombs uh, and napalm probably and shooting rockets and shooting the gun. It's good training in a demanding environment. But um, I, I want to go back a little bit to the A7. It's a single seat airplane. It's our first really uh, computer assisted bombing. There's a lot manual to it, but but you've got get more help. It's a high tech fighter. It doesn't it doesn't look like it, um, and it is single seat. So I'm going to lead you back to that picture in Southeast Asia. Becoming a single seat fighter pilot in combat is something that almost everybody else wouldn't want to do, but but guys like us and gals like us who want to fly fighters want would rather be no other place. Agree or disagree? Agree. I I agree. I, and it was a wonderful airplane. I'll tell you, it, was a, it wasn't the prettiest airplane. If you went to the flight line with your girlfriend, you might point to another airplane. <laughs> that's, that's the one I fly. <laughs> like this one over here, the, the very beautiful looking Eagle. You might yep. say that's my plane. That we flew together. That we flew together. I, and I flew for 15 years in the Air Force. But the A7 was beautiful in its own way. It, was a, it had a, a, a kind of a small computer by today's standards. You're not much more than an Atari. But you got to keep in mind that we went to the moon with a 4K computer. Yeah. And the A7 had a, just a fantastic avionics suite. It was a, a game changer in its way. It had an inertial navigation system tied in with, to, uh, to the computer. It had a Doppler system to update, to update that. So you always knew where you were. And one of the ways you knew you, where you were was we had a projected map display, actually a little round mm -hmm. scope there that continuously showed where you were on a map which is something I really wish we'd had in the Eagle. But because, yes, absolutely. Because we would not have gotten lost as much as we did. But anyway. And that, it was, was years until they eventually, in later models of the F-15, had a uh, poor person's version of that. Nothing yeah. like the wound map display in the, in the um, slough. And, and it was, you're right, it was not attractive. It was the airplane I wanted to fly out of pilot training, Keena. I think I've told you this. Uh, for two reasons. One, it was high tech. More importantly, it was um, single seat and my uh, social skills are ideally suited to being alone. So I thought that was, had nothing to do with vomiting, but, but I knew I, I could, you know, if I, if I was single seat, I'd be flying with my best friend. Um, but it was a great airplane. Unfortunately, it, uh, when I graduated from pilot training, they weren't available. Uh, because there were engine problems, it was not overpowered, was it? No, no, it was not. We had we had what we actually upgraded from the Navy airplane. We put a TF forty one Allison engine in it, which produced more thrust, but still, on on a hot day with as much stuff as we carried, like the airplane weighed about twenty three thousand pounds, and we could carry twenty three thousand pounds worth of, of bombs and fuel and rockets and all this kind of stuff. And with that load, it was really an adventure getting off the runway. So it was. It, it didn't have an afterburner, but it could fly around with this fan jet, fan engine, which was something that right. most fighter jets back in those days were turbo jets. This was a fan jet. It was very efficient. We could fly around at 450 plus all day at low altitude. 450 knots. 500 plus miles an hour. About 500 miles an hour. Um, the and on your second combat sortie, uh, you almost didn't get it airborne because. <laughs> yeah. Of, you, oh yeah. Right. I used all but three hundred. I used all but three hundred feet of the runway at Karad Air Base. I, I had a load of uh, rockets and cluster bomb units and tanks, and about uh, two thirds into my takeoff roll, one of my rocket pods, which has a, what's a, what they call a frangible nose cone, just exploded yep. and it became flat plate drag and it slewed me to the right. And I had some time to think about what was going to happen next because I wasn't accelerating. My takeoff speed was about one hundred, well, two hundred miles an hour. Let's put it that way, and. I could see the end of the runway coming up and my options were limited. I could either jettison everything or I could eject or I could mm -hmm. just, uh, th that was really, about the, or I could punch everything off, in which case all that ordinance is going to be flying in formation if you down the runway. So I barely, I did make it off the runway in the last 300 feet. I disappeared over the horizon. People were looking for smoke out there. And basically I managed to just barely keep the airplane airborne in ground effect until I got enough airspeed to join my leader who wondered where the heck I was at this point. And then we continued on down to Cambodia so, to do our mission. 
to do your mission. So people might think you might, you must have been terrified. I'm going to answer for you, um, yeah. just so we can stay. You're not. You're too busy to be terrified. Yeah. And I suspect if it does kill you, and you be, you know, you're going to be a flaming mess in the on the terrain. That there's there is a second where you actually are terrified. But once you fly out of it, you feel yeah, I did that. You know, pretty cool. Yes, yeah, so you, you get kind of tensed up a little bit, but you're you are thinking fairly fast. I was we used Easy. to call cutting buttonholes in my seat cushion. Those <laughs> of you with imagination know what I'm talking about here. Right. So uh, let's get back to bombing Hawaii, which you okay actually were asked to do. I, I mean, the, you and I, as we've done many times in the past, could talk about flying for hours, weeks, months, years, and yes. we'll probably do that at our little claw 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 reunion here coming up in November. So there you are. Uh, you've survived the Southeast Asia War. You're deployed to Hawaii, um, flying show formations that are probably illegal um, off Waikiki. Uh, you're, you've got a, a bomb with your then fiance's name, I think. So Kina, you're just doing firepower demos and uh, living large and going sailing and having life. And they ask you to bomb Mauna Loa, the volcano on the Big Island, right? Yes, yeah, yes. We, we were doing this fire pack. Well, well, the we were t we, we had a briefing with some geologists from Hawaii. They came in and with some air uh, some Air Force brass and actually some Navy brass, and they said they told us that they had rim activity on Mauna Loa, which they've had before, and it was creating these lava tunnels that were slowly moving toward the city of Hilo, and uh, and they said. Well, they, they wanted to know if we could actually bomb the sides of these things and divert the lava flow. Now, th these tubes are really large and are very slow moving. And we said, yeah, we can do that. And they uh, basically tested us. They put some panels on the ground and we bombed those with BDU-33s, which is a little 25-pound blue practice 25 bomb. Pounds, yep. this one. And we actually hit the targets. We were good at that. So they said, oh, yeah, we trust you now to hit the sides of the volcano, so, or the, the sides of the tube. So they would basically put these big about 25 foot white panels on the sides of the lava tubes and uh they told us to have at it we took off yeah. uh with a pick i'm sorry well i want to point out uh, to show this old airplane again this is a b5a this was yes. not the first time this had happened the yes. army air force air corps at the time in 1935 had tried this with smaller bombs and a lot less accuracy they did it again in 1942 when it was an emergency again the lava flows but in 1976 it was kind of a an experiment was well, it they, well they, they didn't tell they didn't express it that way to us they said it was real lava flow that was coming down and they put the panels out for us to bomb on the sides of the lava flow now if you see the reports that they've that have been published since it makes it sound like, like it was an experiment that's not what they were telling us they were telling us they were, these were real flows and they also said we were successful at it. We actually crushed the sides of some of these uh, tubes. We made, with these 2,000 pound bombs, we made about uh, 100 foot craters in the side of them. And we also bombed um, what are called spatter cones, which are little, yeah. little mini volcanoes that come out the side of the volcano. So we dropped, over a period of about a week, we dropped 36 of these two granders. And the Hawaii geologists told us we had to keep this to ourselves. It has to be quiet. <laughs> and I can't imagine. That if this was going on, it wouldn't, and people knew about it, it wouldn't be on the front page of the Honolulu Star Advertiser, yeah. or whatever newspaper you have. As far as I can time. tell, it wasn't. And I, we it, just it showed wasn't. an A, A7 with a 2,000 pounder. A little bomb 101, folks. Uh, Kina yeah. and I have both dropped 500 pound bombs. They're kind of impressive, especially if you're near where they hit. A 2,000 pounder is really different. And I wouldn't say it's a small nuke, but it's a big explosion. So the notion that you're going to drop, and you guys eventually drop, 36 of these 2,000 pounders on the volcano. Can I, can you imagine the meeting where they decided to ask the Air Force to do this? Yeah, yeah, I got an idea. Yeah, let's <laughs> let's go bomb the volcano. Yeah. How does but, that well, happen? It, uh, I, I don't know how it came down the chain of command. I was just the guy told to go out and do it. And it was, yeah. a, it was a fun time. Dropping a two grander off your airplane, really, you really get a, quite a bit of lift when those thing goes off. Plus, you can, you can see it. It's so big, you can see it fly right down to yeah. where it hits. 
pretty exciting stuff. Plus it makes about a 2000 foot plume up into the air. So how we keep the secret from people, I really don't know, but it, they did a good job because you really didn't hear much about it anywhere. So and if, it was kind of you, sad for us. Yeah, you we, wanted we thought, to be the heroes of Hilo, right? Cause you'd say it's Hilo. Hero. We thought we might at least get a free drink out of it at the bar, uh, but no, bar. no. And if you folks, if you uh, do an internet search as I did in preparation for today's episode, of course, You'll find almost nothing. Uh, Key and I found a, uh, um, a, a report, an academic style report from a U.S. geologist, a government geologist, and somebody at headquarters Pacific Air Forces in 1980. There's no trace of this. There's plenty about the 1935 bombings, the 1942 bombings, but somehow they they kept it quiet. Were they to seek to do this again, which I think is unlikely given the um, paperwork, let's say, that would have to be done yeah. to get approval. I don't think they'd keep it secret. Um, so it it worked, but we probably won't do it again unless there's a real emergency, like is depicted in the Korean movie, Ashfall, which is about <laughs> North Korean and South Korean forces joining together to stop a volcano at the North Korea-China border. I just learned about that movie today. So let me take a very quick break and uh, tell you that you can find the uh, episodes from previous editions of Figments, the Power of Imagination and Figments on Reality, the show I did for about a year uh, at these QR codes. So feel free to scan that. We'll leave it up there long enough. And of course, I will be back next uh, in two weeks with another show. I'm not sure what it will be. Probably about flying because that seems to be pretty popular. Okay, so uh, as I said, I worked for uh, Kenai, and he's one of, he was a tremendous mentor, uh, but we knew he had artistic talent because we had paintings in the squadron that he had done, and uh, Bob, I always thought that that you just, you know, you always did art, but it's far, it's a far more exquisite evolution than that. Tell us how you how you got to be an artist as a squadron artiste and then a real artist. And here's a, a picture that was in the squadron that Bob and I served in together with his daughter, Katie, who now uh, serves as a foreign service officer in the U.S. State Department. Thank you for your service, Katie. Go ahead. Tell, well, tell me how this evolved as the squadron artiste well, turned real artiste. Yeah, I can always draw well. And then, and then later I started to paint, especially when I got into... Uh, uh, some of the fighter squadrons, I thought they, they needed some uh, aviation art on the wall, so I started doing that. In fact, when I was at Langley in 1976 when the first wing started up there, and I had a, one of the Bitburg squadron commanders, Fred Fitzsimmons, came through and saw some of my paintings and said, did you do this, can, can I? I said, yes. Sir. He said, I need a squadron artiste, and he got me orders within a week to go to Bitburg. He didn't say, I need a really good pilot, or <laughs> he says, I need a yeah, squadron but artiste. But you were a good pilot, and I would just point out, you know, that every every good fighter squadron, as we both know, has a unique collection of talent, and there are a few yes. things you need. You need an artiste. You need somebody to make sure the bar is nice wood. Thanks, Doc Doolittle. He was not a pilot, yes. but but Doc gave us the. You need a piano. Must have a piano player. We'll see yeah. a piano player. Dave Lewins yeah. in Arizona. Lewins. Um, and uh, and so on. You've got to have this collection of talent. You have to have, you want to win the golf tournament, you have to have one good golfer. That's exactly why we hired Smutty Smith in the squadron. He was an incredible fighter pilot, but this collection of talent makes a good squadron great. So and, you were and I have artiste. to say, Fig, I have to say, Fig, I, I was the squadron commander and also the squadron artiste, and you were the ops option. We had the best fighter squad that I you have did. ever been in. It was amazing. We had the most amazing group of people who work together really well. And we not only taught those guys how to be good F-15 pilots, we taught them, we showed them what a fighter squad is supposed to look like. And I, I really think that a lot of those yep. guys went on and later said to themselves, if I ever get to be a squadron commander, I want it to look like this because we had such a great team and you were such a great ops officer. You made it really easy for me to do my job. It's fantastic. Yep, and right. uh, so I was really, 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 yeah. really proud of your uh, climb up the ladder. Well, thanks. So um, you did a bunch of art throughout your uh, military career. 
Um, and that includes later at there, here's an A7 <laughs> with artistic license based on yes. the volcano bombing because it has two Mark 84s on, yes. on each wing. And it's the wrong landscape. That's from Hawaii <laughs> as opposed to the Big Island. But that's yes. a pretty, you know, in the past, had I not, we had not had this conversation, that's a pretty simple painting. You know, it's kind of an airplane and the landscape. And I'm colorblind, as you may or may not recall. Um, but but I think it looks okay. But uh, what later, after uh, you work for the airlines, you like to say you work for a nonprofit company, um, <laughs> American Airlines. You, yes. Your paintings are more refined, even when they're airplanes. And I'm showing this because uh, this is a painting of my jet in combat that we'll get to there. And folks, um, let me unblur my background here. And you'll see it behind me if that's the painting up above my head there. So um, that's more... Uh, sophisticated, frankly. How did that evolution to become a real artist happen? Well, well, well like you said, I had a I, I had a relatively perfect career in the Air Force. I spent 20 years just flying single seat fighters. And when I finally got out in uh, 1991, I had a lot of time on my hands, like three or four days a week off. And I decided, <laughs> among a lot of other things, I was going to make a deep dive into art and learn how to do it. So I started. I got some books on the way the old masters learn, and the way the old masters learn was painting copies of old masters. So I started making reproductions of things, a lot of, a lot of bad forgeries of other people's pictures. <laughs> but I learned a lot of things like, uh, like how to prime canvases and how to do underpainting. Oil painting takes several layers. It's a lot of patience. And that picture, that, that picture of you, has, I think has a really nice picture that it has a lot of cool elements in it, including mm -hmm. the reflection of the afterburner, you know, the kind of a hazy, day that you have at Aviano quite a bit of the time and, yeah, was... and the ordinance you're taking off with it really has a sense of purpose I think and and I have to say also big for people who don't know it Dan Leaf was the uh, wing commander there as a one-star general commanding the Air Force's largest composite wing in a very righteous exercise called Allied Force it was uh, 1999 and it was one of the most successful uses of air power in Air Force history and uh, it, it was basically to keep uh, the Republic of Yugoslavia from committing genocide against uh, Kosovo Albanians. And it was so successful. We, very few civilians got hurt. Almost nobody on our side got hurt. It was over in a couple of months. It turned the government over. And the reason you don't know about it is it was so successful that people don't remember it. It seems all we remember is our mm -hmm. failures. So yep. uh, I think that would be the dream of every fighter pilot is to be in that position, Fig, to be that wing commander taken off and leading those people on that uh, on that mission. It was the easiest job I ever had because I had people like us working for me in a righteous cause. And I had the example that you'd provided. So oh, thanks. Oh, thank you. But but let's get back to art. And uh, okay. so you, I, I love that painting as well. I've got my jacket behind me on the chair that you painted a Claw Eagle on and that I received at the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum at <laughs> my retirement That's right. post. I got what quick aside on that, an Army general officer, I retired as a three-star, I don't believe it either, um, came to me afterwards because it was a real roast. And he said, Dang, are Air Force parties always like this? I, said, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, you, um, you progressed technically, and one of the paintings you uh, sent me as, as an example example is this photo of apples and that looks like an exercise in artistic perfection to me is that a good way was this yeah. like practice and getting it as as perfect as you can yes yeah, it's just a good example of still lifes I've, I've done a lot of very very finely detailed still lifes on masonite board which is mm -hmm. it takes quite a bit of patience but i've got i've got a whole raft of these kind of things around the house yeah um that took me about like six, seven hours to knock that out. And it's, it takes several layers and it's wow. uh, a little bit of finesse. Six or seven hours, it wouldn't take, well, I couldn't do it. It wouldn't take <laughs> me a certain time. You also, you talked about um, uh, the masters and, and uh, copying them, not counterfeiting, but practicing. This one, uh, because of both its striking beauty and the story behind it uh, intrigued me because they reflect you as 
as I know you. Tell a little bit about this painting, please. Yep, this is called the this is called the Fighting Temeraire being towed to be broken up. It's actually one of the most famous pictures that you'll find in England. It is it's very evocative, as a, as an artist might say. What it is, this air this airplane, this ship, the Temeraire was in the uh, Battle of Trafalgar, and it was mm -hmm. a hero ship. It actually had subdued two French ships on either side of it, pounded them into submission, and um, and later. It was later, of course, decommissioned and became kind of a hulk. And what this picture, the painter, the, the guy who actually did the original, J.M.W. Turner, uh, England's greatest landscape artist, he actually mm. painted this picture. The idea was, here you have this ghost ship being towed up the Thames River by this newfangled steam machine to be broken up. And really what it represents at the time was all of the old soldiers of the Napoleonic Wars that were kicking off, just like our World War II wow. veterans are, and, and even our Vietnam veterans are nowadays. So it's something I think you and I can re relate to a little bit. Wow. Um, and, and you paint a lot for other folks. You don't, um, maybe you make some money. We have your website. Uh, if you look for Bob Keeney Fine Art on Facebook, you can find it there. And I, I think we've shown the website during the show, but you paint for other people. For example, I went into um, a Chilean uh, defense school office where the Air Force Two Star was in charge, but they had a picture of a, a ship behind him. And I said, dude, <clears throat> you're a fighter pilot, man. I'm horrible. Why do you have a ship? And he and I graciously painted a beautiful picture of a, a Chilean F-16, like my friend Eduardo Man had flown. So you, you, you give a lot uh, of yourself in your artwork, and that's pretty cool. Uh, Got one more picture, I think, of your nurse, as we call her. Yes. Barb, uh, you guys are a great team, and um, I can't wait to see you in November when we have our little reunion. Um, there, There's so much that we could talk about, not just from what we've talked about already, but from our time together. Uh, but let me ask you what your next figment is. I tend to close with your next figment what's the next thing you want to do could be the next painting could be the next uh getting getting over some recent surgery and starting to ride your bike again what what's next on bob keeney's list well the next thing for me is learning to walk again <laughs> yeah. i just had my right hip replaced so i'm getting around with the cane i've been spoiled by my my nurse wife for for about five weeks now so i'm hoping to get better with that i and bet I she's as anxious a, for your recovery as you are yes <laughs> and S S Smurf asked me to make a, a print for the reunion, and I'm, I'm, I'm putting that together. I'm thinking of doing a Bob Keeney original print for this, a, a painting for this, uh, for this November reunion, which or should the, be a lot of fun. 426, killer claw, claw, claw. Uh, Keeney, yes. thanks. Uh, <laughs> thanks for everything. I, I'll never thank you enough for all the things you gave me uh, in terms of lessons. And one of the things that you taught me when I became your ops officer, suddenly we both went into this job as commander and ops officer with little notice were things that, yeah, Ting, you remember as a little five-year-old, right. I think, Key and I uh, yeah. shared on uh, Imagine Effective Leadership episode of Pigments. You can find it on the playlist. And she is a leadership guru. I rewatched that episode, folks. If you haven't seen it, go see it again. But she talked about things that, that make us happy connecting, having a purpose, and mastering something. So that's really the key to happiness. And uh, Kenai, you've connected with the world and with people through your art uh, with an altruistic purpose, and you've really mastered it. So what would Fig do? Something like that, except I have no artistic talent. So I just say, continue your lifelong growth. You're never done. Keep growing. Keep trying. It's worth it. Kenai, thanks so much. I'll see you in November. Thanks. Thank you. It's been great being on your, your show. Okay, and thanks to Think Tech Hawaii, a great uh, nonprofit corporation here in Hawaii that makes it possible for citizen journalists like yours truly to bring you Figments, the Power of Imagination, and 30 other shows every week. So please donate to Think Tech Hawaii and keep us on the air. See you next time.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.